Um, good evening, everybody. So La Trobe University acknowledges the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which we meet this evening, and we pay our respects to their elders past and present. My name is Rob Pike, and I am the Pro Vice-Chancellor of the College of Science, Health and Engineering at La Trobe University. On behalf of the university, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first event for the Bold Thinking series for this year. There will be seven other bold thinking events held this year, both in the city and in some of our regional areas where our campuses are located. And we look forward to a great year on the back of our 50th anniversary celebrations last year. Now to tonight's topic. It has been five years since the National Disability Insurance Scheme, or the NDIS, was launched with the promise of revolutionizing the care and support of people with disabilities. In 2018, it's time to ask, has that commitment been delivered? Tonight's event will explore what's working and what's failing with the marketization, individualization, that's a hard word, and insurance principles that underpin the NDIS model. What does this mean for the people that the system has been set up to support? Is life any better for them and their carers? Is the system actually delivering on the ambitious targets first set by the policymakers and politicians. So we have a distinguished panel tonight. On tonight's panel, we have Professor Chris Bigby, or Christine Bigby, who is the director of the Living with Disability Research Center at La Trobe University and a professor of social work. Her research has focused on the effectiveness of social programs and policies that aim to support the social inclusion of people with intellectual disability in adulthood and later life. She has published extensively in peer-reviewed journals and is the founding editor of the Journal of Policy and Practice in Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. Joining her is Dr. Jane Tracy, a medical practitioner who has worked for 30 years with people with disabilities and their families. Jane also has an adult son with intellectual, physical, and associated communication disabilities, and so has both a personal and professional understanding of the field. She is director for the Center for Developmental Disability Health Victoria at Monash Health, and an external member of the Living with Disability Research Center at La Trobe. Our third panelist is Dr. Lisa Chaffee, an experienced and accomplished leader across the fields of disability, community development, and sport. Lisa has a unique mix of experience as an elite athlete, academic, and occupational therapist. She weaves her lifelong experience of being a wheelchair user into learning opportunities for industry, health professional students, and people with disabilities. She was part of a La Trobe team that researched the inclusion of students with disabilities in higher and further education. She now works in private practice as an NDIS registered occupational therapist. Finally, Rick Morton is the social affairs writer at The Australian with a particular policy focus on the National Disability Insurance Scheme, aged care and population, but also writing on homelessness, social trends, drugs and religion. A heady mix, Rick. Yes. <laughs> I will now hand over to tonight's host, broadcaster, journalist, and writer, Francis Leach, and the panel. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for being here this evening. Uh, we had a bit of a discussion in the week leading up to tonight's event about how to conduct this particular forum and this particular discussion. And what was apparent to all of us in our discussion was that uh, we can't represent up here tonight the lived experience of everyone, the, the sort of rich and challenging experience of everyone who needs the NDIS to work for them. So we're not going to pretend to do that because that would be disingenuous. What we can do, though, is have a single conversation in a forum like this about what is important, what needs to be done, and try to cover off as best we can in the hour and a half, because it's a conversation that, is, you know, in its totality would demand so much more time to uh, do what we can to also harness, as we acknowledge, your extraordinary experience and knowledge and depth of uh, practice in this room as well. So we're not pretending to be the answer, but we are going to ask the questions, and that's what the Bold Thinking series is all about. 
Uh, to that end, there will be questions at the end of uh, our conversation here. I do ask that if you are to ask a question, please make it a question. Statements are for another time and another place. The only way that we're really going to have a conversation is we ask questions and answer them. So please keep that in mind as we move through the conversation here tonight. I want to start with you, Christine, and talk big picture stuff at the start. Five years ago, the policy became reality. But in the pitch, in the cell for the NDIS, what were you told? What were people told it was going to deliver? The pitch was this is going to revolutionise the support for people with disabilities across the board, that it was going to be an economically sound policy, that it would uh, be neutral uh, in cost in the long run because it would free up uh, people who are caring for people with disabilities to go back to work. It would provide uh, jobs uh, and employment for people with disabilities. But I think the important thing is it's three layers. So the first layer of the NDIS was about revolutionising the way in which we funded and, and funded disability services. So instead of funding services per se, we would fund individuals based on their individual needs and an individual plan, and they would use that money to go into the marketplace to buy a service. And the service providers would be dependent on individual consumers coming to them to purchase services. So that's, that's the tip of the iceberg and that's what we've heard most about. But there's another layer under that which was about broader social change for those people who didn't meet the individualised funding criteria. It was about changing social structures, mainstream services and facilities to make them more accessible to everybody in the community. And then the bottom layer was everybody in terms of shifting social attitudes towards people with disabilities, lifting expectations and treating everybody as equal citizens. So it was an enormous uh, offer, I think, that was, was taken up by the government after enormous uh, campaign. Uh, an extraordinary promise to make and one that would be very difficult to deliver in a short space of time. What's the report card generally? Let's start at the bottom tier and then we'll work our way up the pyramid. So Lisa, how do you think uh, the NDIS has shifted or has it not shifted the general understanding perception within the community about disability, the capacity of people with disability, the responsibility and opportunity that uh, people have uh, living, working and uh, loving people with disability and just shifted thinking so that it's actually improved the quality of life and experience for people? Well, it's improved the quality of life in that individualised packaging has um, opened up great opportunities for people. Prior to the NDIS, the existing services really focused for people with physical disabilities on, um, I guess, safety and hygiene. You know, if you could get, get on and off your toilet, you were doing well. Whereas with the NDIS, that's broadened life to be once you're on and off your toilet and you're dressed for the day, there's now something to do or there's opportunities. However, the, the component that Chris is talking about, which was a wonderful promise of shifting the social milieu, I guess, hasn't really taken off because of, I think, the uh, speed at which people are being absorbed into the system. So all resources and energy is, is devoted to the individualised package and not so much to changing the, the world in which we live. That, do you think, James, because there are people with immediate needs who feel they need to be met, or, and they obviously do need to be met, and therefore people are, are wanting to use that top tier approach to try to address their personal needs, where maybe there are other aspects of the NDIS that might be more applicable to them? Uh, yes, I, I, I'd like to say, first of all, that I think NDIS has changed the world. <laughs> it, it has already created a profile for people with a disability, um, an awareness of the range of disability and the needs of disability and the rights of people with disability to be part of our community in a way that wasn't there before. It's, it's uh, raised numerous conversations about disability um, in all different aspects of life. Um, and so if we're talking about that pyramid that Chris was referring to, the foundation was the community, the whole community of um, 23 million Australians all of whom now, or that's probably over egging the pudding a bit, but most of whom now would have heard of the NDIS and have some awareness of disability and the need for people with disabilities to be supported in order to participate and contribute to our community. We all know now that if we have a catastrophic 
injury or we're born with a disability or we have an illness that leads to a disability, we have that insurance of knowing that our community will care for us in that instance. That's for us all. The next bit is the problematic bit from my point of view, that upskilling and resourcing and um, preparing better mainstream services to better meet the needs of the diversity that's within our population, one axis of which is disability. And I don't think we've done that well enough. And that means that many people who have um, needs that are not being met in our mainstream <coughs> services. And Can you I give us an example health, of, of some of those that, you, that we might be talking about? Well, a big one in, um, is our education system and kids with autism spectrum disorders. So autism is a huge spectrum of experience um, and for those with very severe autism, nobody would argue that they indeed fit the criteria for the NDIS and are eligible for individual funding. But, but, it's, but it's a spectrum and, it's a, and there's, somebody has to draw a line somewhere about where, who's eligible and mm. who's not. And if our mainstream education system isn't looking at each individual child and isn't providing for the needs of each individual child and isn't resourced to do that adequately, then people will be knocking on the door of the NDIS saying, let me in, let me in, and feel like it's, a, it's either a pass or a fail. Your success is getting into the NDIS, which is a, a peculiar and rather uh, distorted view of a scheme for people with severe disability, that you win the prize if you get in. So um, things have rather been turned on their head, and that's an example of um, where perhaps the failure of adequate resourcing of mainstream services, in this case education, means that people are pushing to get into the NDIS and that's only meant to be, that's the top of the pyramid and that's only meant mm. to be for those with the most severe disability. Do you think that's well understood in the wider community, Rick? The, the no, I, I think one of the key issues with the NDIS, when we talk about whether the NDIS is doing well or whether it will succeed or fail, I think the NDIS itself as a scheme will um, come good in a few years mm, after yeah. all these battles with implementation. Um, the thing that we have forgotten, or a lot of people have forgotten, is that when we talk about failure, what we mean is that the other systems around the NDIS mm. may fail, and they are indeed failing. The state governments are withdrawing programs. Yes. Um, they're withdrawing advocacy funding to help people get into the NDIS. Um, Why are they doing that? Do these are just well, <laughs> look, I've got a real bugbear about this from the yeah. very beginning. So um, just to set the scene, the NDIS was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Um, the then federal government, the, uh, the Gillard government, took that opportunity um, and legislated it. And in doing so, they had to make all these separate deals with every state and territory, or as many as they could get at the time. And they had to do that really quickly. Um, and because they were in a position of um, less bargaining power, the states got a really good deal. And there was, no, uh, there, was no, there was always a guarantee of continuity of support in those agreements, but there was no guarantee of precise programs um, to say, what will you keep? What do you have to fund for X amount of time? It was just this kind of nebulous idea that the states may or may not continue to do what they were always doing for people who, who would never design to be in the NDIS. There are lots of people in that middle tier um, who won't, you know, they'll be the 461st thousand person. Mm. Um, and that's where I think the real issues are for the NDIS. Is it a case also, before we come to you, Chris, again, that because the cost burden of the NDIS is significant, and I was talking just on a TV program just the other day, it seems counterintuitive to me that the shrinking tax base, reducing company taxes, the pressure to have a downward uh, uh, approach to tax revenues, yeah. the pressure's going to fall back on the states and the gap between the states and the federal government to come up with the funds to uh, be able to keep the NDIS growing to meet the needs. That's actually really interesting. So one of the key parts of those agreements and negotiations was that the federal government and the states would essentially split at 50-50. It's slightly different, but essentially 50-50. But the federal government, because it has a bigger opportunity to raise taxes, like income tax, um, in those agreements it says that they will bear the cost of 100% of any overrun in the NDIS. Um, the states don't have to do that. So now the states have this 
uh, weird world where they, they can withdraw from services with impunity if they so feel. Have you got an example of, well, of a recent... Yeah, well, I mean, so there's... Sorry. Yeah. Can I Christ give an yes, example? Yes, yeah, just, <laughs> Christine has a very good example. Yeah. Well, Christine. There's an example in New yeah. South Wales of the New South Wales Council on Intellectual Disability. Yeah. It is the leading organisation that includes people with intellectual disability in policy and systemic advocacy that supports people to be included and to lead that type of advocacy. And it's, it's made significant changes in the last 20 years. And it's an organisation run by and for people with intellectual disabilities. That organisation is under threat of losing all of its core funding. And how would the government argue a case to do that? The government will say, well, you can have project funding through the ILC, the middle layer. Of, of, of the NDIS and the state government in New South Wales is saying, well, we're completely withdrawing from disability services. Mm -hmm. So they've tendered out all their group homes, all their specialist services. They're shutting the doors on all of the disability services. That will be a tragic loss yeah. if that organisation closes. The leadership and the development, the political participation of people with intellectual disabilities will just disappear in New South Wales if that goes. And if that happens, does that inevitably lead to replication across the country. If New South Wales does it, we'll see other states do it. Well, similar. Victoria has a unique system with their mental health services in that um, all the mental health services are coming under NDIS, or the money for. So if you are one of the people in the individualised service packages, there's what's going to be left? And it's still an unknown quantity what's going to be left for a whole lot of people. The, the Department of Health, the Federal Department of Health estimated that there would be 90,000 people currently receiving individual mental health support mm. who would be eligible for the NDIS. But the NDIS sums, uh, the modelling for the NDIS said that, you know, only 57,000 people, which was um, jumped up to 64,000 with inflation. Mm. But, and that's the Department of Health. I mean, that's the same agency, um, the same body of government that's running the NDIS. And there's a 30,000 gap there. The gap is probably a lot higher than that. Mm. And that's just mental yep. health. Um, and this is, again, this is not the NDIS's fault. Um, or the NDIA's fault. Um, mm. Writing those acronyms in my stories is really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> the two different ones. And that's where I, um, and you've got, you know, I wrote a story about a, a forensic mental health service in Queensland that was always state funded. And for these were for, for people who had, you know, they were dangers to themselves and other people, um, but they received individual support to live in the community after they've been released from jail or prison. Um, and then the federal partnership agreement ended and the state government decided that they didn't want to put that money back in their budget so they just wrote to families and they said you've got a week and after a week you won't have any money um, and but that program wasn't picked up by the NDIS not originally not until I wrote some stories about it and now there's a special agreement between the two bodies but that mm. you have to pick out every single example before anyone acts on it. Can I build on that? Which goes back to the, the one of the issues with marketisation, mm -hmm. that uh, it, there's, a, there's an assumption that there is a market of services out there to purchase. And, and there's been a couple of horrific cases in, in Victoria where uh, one ma young man in particular, he, he, his service imploded. They couldn't provide the right support for him anymore. He ended up getting arrested. He ended up in prison. He was in prison for at least four months while they tried to find a service provider who would be able to build an individual service. He had the money, he had $1.5 million, but he didn't have a service provider that was willing and able to provide those services. I would imagine and that the logistics of living in a rural community or living you know, in, a, in a different circumstance where provision of service uh, is more costly or more difficult is not market attractive to providers in individual circumstances where people find themselves like that. So it goes back to, to we need the state governments to be the providers of last resort to do take some more stewardship of the market and start to plan it a bit more than has been happening so that those sort of gaps don't open up. I mean, in the UK, for instance, where they've gone down an individualised track, they have commissioners, so they, they have a middleman who commissions services. So there's a, a much more of a planning element, whereas we just have 460 individual people planning the market, and it's clearly should, not going to work well. Can I ask, should there be a level of obligation? So in this circumstance where the marketisation of the provision of these services will, let's face it, there will be providers who will make money. This is a business. So this is a, publicly listed companies, no doubt, are providing these services. Mm -hmm. Is it not too much to ask that in doing so that there's a level of statutory obligation 
to those organisations, even when it, you know, in individual cases it might not be cost effective for them to provide services, that in order to access this business model that they have to provide those services? Mm. Would that work? Potentially, but then you've got a government saying run your own business and consult to us, but now we're going to tell you how to run your business so you can consult to us. So you... well, the people have got to come first, don't they? Well, I think oh, so. A stupid idea and all, but... <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> um, I think so. However, I mean, you, if you're a service provider in a small country town and you have to travel two hours to get to your client who needs one hour's support in the morning, is that cost effective for you to run eventually, over time? And if not, who else is that person going to call on? They're real challenges. So we're talking five years in, Jane, and I just want to sort of ask you, this seems to have been a series of unintended consequences from a policy that's based mm. in, a, in a big vision mm. with, with you know, a good idea and goodwill at its heart. How important is it that these things get ironed out now before they become truly entrenched in the system and, and we, we have no way back? Well, it's tremendously important and these gaps are opening up and we're seeing them perhaps in a new light for the first time. Um, and the issues of the provider of last resort, you know, for, for people who have nowhere else to live because um, of their behaviours or whatever it is that causes other services not to offer um, the, the service that they need are becoming more and more of an issue. And in fact, what's happening is people are turning up in the ED of health department of, of hospitals because that is your place of last resort. If nobody else will address the issue, you take the person to the ED and you say, "Fix it." Um, so that this is having implications uh, down the track, just as the case that uh, Chris mentioned, it was the justice system that uh, became the the accommodation of last resort for that young man. So these gaps are opening up. We're seeing what's happening. We're seeing where the deficiencies are and we're seeing where markets are failing. Um, the exciting thing and optimistic thing in my view is that the NDIS is open to learning and keeps on changing the way in which things are being offered and the pathway in which people enter the scheme and the services that are being offered and the ways in which they're being offered through the NDIS. So you're seeing that dynamic change happening as it, it, as it moves It on. is happening, and th the downside is it means it's very confusing and the goalposts yes. keep changing and, and, and everybody <laughs> feels confused. And if you I've say, never seen one organisation learn so many lessons. No, so quickly. <laughs> so quickly, and they And respond, change. And, they and, have respond responded, they have. and keep on changing. Sometimes after a lot of prodding, but they are responding. Yes, but they are responding and they're wanting to, to mm. learn, and it's, it, the, the culture has been right from the beginning and continues to be, we want to hear what's not working and we want to work with you to fix it. So I'm very... Um, it's a, it's, it's a shame it's taken five years, <laughs> but the trial sites, there was so much in-kind support provided. It wasn't a real market trial, and it's really only now that the, that the markets are becoming clear what, what, where the gaps are, I think. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm still looking at yeah. that goal and thinking we're heading in the right direction, but, boy, the road's a bit bumpier than we had hoped that it would be. Christine, we talked the big picture and the, the structural stuff a bit. Let's talk a little bit about the individual experience about, for instance, being designated within the NDIS and where you sit within that pyramid. What are the major challenges you've seen emerge from that? So I think the major challenge that, that was always there with individualisation was it, there was an assumption built into the scheme that everybody who was eligible would be the perfect consumer, would be able to identify their own needs uh, articulate them, lay a claim, get what they needed and then be able to go out and purchase services. And, and we know that that works really well for people like Lisa, uh, for people like Jane's son who have Jane as a really strong advocate. And, and the research shows from overseas that that's a really good system for some people, but it completely benefits people who have lots of social capital. People the people that I worry about, the people that I do research about, are people with intellectual disabilities who find it incredibly difficult to articulate their own needs, who need a lot of support 
to do that, to see that through, whose needs often change over time. And those people have found it really hard. And the NDIS has recognised that, and they now talk about having pre-planning, so that you have to come with your pre-plan, you have to be prepared when you meet a planner. But the problem is, we know from our research, you know, two-thirds of people who moved out of Kew Cottages Nobody knows them well. Mm. They don't have families. They don't have strong advocates. They're reliant on their service provider, who's obviously got a conflict of interest, to represent them in their conversation with the NDIS. So equity is, is a major issue. We're seeing enormous differences. Some people are doing really well, and some people aren't doing so well. And I think that's something that needs to be addressed systemically within the system. Well, Jane, you, you've had to do, do this for your son. So Absolutely. we'll talk more about the social capacity to get through the, the experience. But for those who don't know, tell us what you had to do to have your son designated to your satisfaction. Well, the, my son's eligibility wasn't in question. I didn't have to prove eligibility because he was already part of the disability system in the state. So some, so, so people who had uh, were using disability services. My son's 32. He lives in supported accommodation. He attends a day service. So he was already deemed eligible. But the pre-planning process, for me, with all my advantages, was tremendously difficult. Um, partly because it kept changing exactly what was expected of us. And we've talked about that change being a good thing, but a confusing thing. Um, and partly because it's such a heavy responsibility for somebody to bear. I know my son um, probably better than anybody else. I've certainly known him longer than anyone else. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, it was, I, I tried very hard to get inside his life, his skin, his, what's important to him in his world, in his life, and what's important for him to be able to keep doing the things that are important to him. Um, but I found that it was a, I felt it was a very weighty responsibility and it put a lot of, um, if you like, performance pressure on me, really. I felt like um, if I could adequately and articulately present that to the planner at our interview, then he would have opportunities that I envisaged for him. If I failed, I would have failed him too. So, you know, if, and I keep thinking, if I find this so difficult and challenging and onerous, um, how much more difficult it is for other people who are not, yeah. haven't got my advantage. I, um, I've, I've done a, a lot of case studies in my time reporting on this, and the ones that really get, I was raised by a single mother um, in a working class, or just above the poverty line, and I've done stories with single mothers who have um, a child with really complex needs, um, they're four, five, six, seven, they're trying to juggle school, they're trying to work, um, and they are just beaten down by mm -hmm. this kind of bureaucracy and the, and the kind of Byzantine nature of how they're meant to get their kid into the scheme. And I remember one in the Blue Mountains was just trying to get, I can't remember exactly, but it was something, it was some modification to a wheelchair so her child could keep her head up. Right. And she battled them for eight months mm -hmm just for that one modica modification because of the way they set up plans. When you want to change something in a plan, yeah. you have to reset the whole thing yeah, yeah. Um, and start again. So, I mean, there are just countless examples like that. Once you get into the NDIS, it's fabulous. Um, once you've got your plan, that um, you've got everything you want in that plan and you get to execute it with the services you want in, and you live in a city and you can buy those services, mm. things are going well. But there are so many of these battles that... And, like, I know that the kind of stress that my mum was under trying to raise us and none of my... I don't have a disability, my brother and sister don't have a disability. I can only begin to imagine what that would be like for those families who already, you know, they just every day is a battle just to stay still. So how do we build capacity for, for people like what Rick was talking about there, about, to give them the same opportunity to, to present their plan or build their plan that allows them to have the same right to have access mm -hmm. to the service that's designed for them that they might not be able to access because they can't articulate it well enough to the people who are going to make the decision. Well, this is a, a very important point. Who are the people making the decision? So when you go to your planning meeting, you're talking with um, an LAC, a local area coordinator, and those people may or may not have knowledge of disability. So you tell your story and your needs and your requirements to that person. They then tell that to the NDIA. So your plans are made on second-hand information. 
It so it's out of be, your hands at that It's point. out of your hands. One of my friends described it as rolling the dice. I'm going to roll the dice with my support needs for the year. And does that also mean that you might have a good LAC mm, who can, yep. can do that job for you, but yep. if you land with somebody who's not quite up to it, you're stuffed? Yep. And there's stories of brilliant LACs that uh, suggest things and, and join the dots where people don't, don't have things in place, but there are other LACs that don't understand disability enough. So it's not so much upskilling the participant at this point, we're certainly preparing the participant, but they should be going to a system that's prepared to hear their stories and, and understand. So we're upskilling the services of the NDIA and their, their stakeholders. I think we need to have um, a system of support that goes for the pre-planning, that, that somebody who walks beside people and, mm -hmm. and mentors them or coaches them or supports them through that journey of preparing the, the plan, the pre-plan for that interview, because that's the foundation of everything. Um, the other thing I'd say is um, even my plan came back with a few errors in it, I mean, just sort of cut and paste errors, you know, yeah. really sort of... <laughs> um, <laughs> obvious errors, uh, it was not possible to get that plan changed, mm. those errors corrected. The, I think the planners are under such mm. huge pressure, uh, work pressure at the moment, that mistakes are being made and, um, and it's not possible to correct them without asking for a review of the plan, which then takes months, mm -hmm. and so we've just let mm. those mistakes mm. go. There's a whole lot of other things that, that become apparent to me in all this. What happens if someone's circumstances dramatically changes? For instance, if they're carer, who's, a, who's yep. a, an older parent gets sick in the middle of their mm -hmm. pamphlet or there's, there's an accident or someone has to, the carer has to move away because the, another job opportunity comes up. What sort of flexibility in the system is there to be able to pivot and actually make sure that that person is still getting the needs, their needs met? That's a really good question I've been asking. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's really not clear. If you're in the scheme and you have a, a support coordinator, then uh, we, we think that there's sort of potential for that person to be your crisis manager. And, you, and the legislation says you can apply for a review of your plan at any time. So as long as you've got somebody, whether it's already a support coordinator or somebody on the outside who can help you, then you sh it should be able to respond to those sorts of situations because there is nobody else out there. We used to have the Department of Human Services that had case managers that did that sort of troubleshooting and, and they've sort of disappeared. No. Rick, have you um, seen examples of this in your, in your uh, journalism? Uh, no, actually not, not direct examples of that situation, but I mean just at Senate estimates a month ago, they were talking about the agency was talk, telling the politicians that you know, as at March, there were 2,000 plans that had just ended that were meant to be renewed. Mm and they hadn't been renewed yet and the average day, uh, the average length of a plan going unrenewed is 30 days. During that time the NDIS conceded that they are asking service providers mm -hmm. to continue providing those services to those people for free until the plan is renewed and at which point they'll back pay them. Um, that's, that's not a way to run a, a system. Um, and there's, they're under so much pressure that, that those kind of stories are happening and I wouldn't have believed that if I hadn't heard that in a parliamentary estimate sitting. And I think coming back to that, I'm on the, the board of a small disability mm -hmm. support organisation and, and the cost to that organisation to do the right thing by the people it's been supporting for years has been enormous. They've, they've, they've gone into deficit deliberately in order to make sure that they've done good pre-planning with people and that they can go and advocate with people in order to get their plans and they've been doing that crisis support when it's necessary. So a lot of the work is falling onto mm. the non-government sector, not-for-profit organisations that, is that also have a strong commitment to the people they support. A retreat by state governments from this sector is forcing the NGO sector to actually step up you know, and take on that responsibility? Should that be something that... The state governments are, are trying to prepare people for the NDIS and how to navigate it? Yeah, I think going back to, to Jane's point, we, we need to identify the people who don't have people in their lives who can act as advocates and make sure they have somebody who knows them well, who can have a long-term trusting relationship with them to support them to make decisions, to think about what their goals are, how they might want their life to change. Yeah. At the moment, we're relying on service providers to do that and yes. service providers have a conflict of interest. This is a really good example of that. Where, you know, I, I think we've had about three inquiries into young people in nursing homes mm -hmm. since, since the late 1980s. And we're like, oh, God, there's 6,000 young people in nursing homes. What are we going to do? 
nothing happens. Have another inquiry. Um, the NDIS was the perfect vehicle to get these people out. Um, yeah. And at the beginning, um, they weren't prioritised in the transition. And then when it came for their turn, so to speak, to be taken out of nursing homes and put into housing or supported accommodation, nobody went looking for them. It was assumed mm. that they had family um, mm. and friends. Um, and for you know a good 30 to 60% of them, they didn't. Um, and the Summer Foundation eventually went looking for them. Yeah. Mm. Um, and it wasn't, un <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't because of the initiative of the NDIS, it was because an NGO was like, oh, hang on, these people are out here, somebody should help them. But it's apparent <laughs> that, that part of this system does require the altruism of a, a good person, particularly for those mm. who are severely incapacitated, to advocate on their behalf. Mm. What if there is no one? If there is no one? That's a good question. Chris, what if there is no one? So what's been happening, if you're already in the system, if you're one of the people, for example, that moved out of an institution, you don't have family, then you've just been rolled over into the scheme and so you've, you've continued with the services that you've always had. And I suspect that for those people, they haven't, nobody's really explored whether they're happy with their life, whether there's other things they want to do. So there is, no, there is nobody saying, oh, we'll come and help you make the most out of this scheme. We'll be the proxy Jane for you to make sure you get what's, you know, what you're entitled to. The other to. group at the, at the other end are, are people with a milder level of disability who live in SRS accommodation. Which is for... Um, specialist, specialist residential, residential services. services. Trying to break down the acronyms. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> speak, um, which are sort of boarding houses where there's somebody that can provide more or less support to somebody on a day to day basis. Now, a lot of those people are marginalised people, often with drug and alcohol issues, often with mental health mm. issues. And um, for them, um, they're not often not able to advocate for themselves, not often able to turn up to the NDIS and say, hey, I want to check out whether I'm eligible. You know, it's just not something that they're doing. Who's speaking for them? Um, and the answer is uh, many of them are being missed. And what's happening is that they're turning up in hospital, as are other people in crisis, um, at the ED or turning up unwell, and then it's the social workers within the health system who are... Um, trying to advocate, trying to skill themselves up on the NDIS to try and advocate for people. And, and with the lack of accommodation, there are a lot of people stuck in hospital, in subacute wards, um, because they haven't got anywhere to go. And this goes back to the middle tier about building yeah. community capacity. Mm. Like, the aim of the NDIS shouldn't be to provide you with an individual support worker who takes you out for coffee once a week and walks you through the community, as uh, people talk, say. What it should be is to provide you with a skilled resource to help you build relationships with other people in the community, to help you find a place where, or places where you might belong and where other people will start to make relationships and support you to be included in community groups. Then you become less dependent on, on, on one advocate. Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing is this very individualised, you know, individual hours of support. You've got this amount of money, it's for this many hours, rather than for skilled support behind the scenes to orchestrate your inclusion in things like community groups and to help you build relationships with other people. And in the long run, those other people will become interested in you and your life and will become your advocates and supporters. So many people, and I'm talking about people with intellectual disabilities, have no one in their lives. And so the aim of this scheme has got to be to use the funds to build those networks so that in 10 years' time we're not here saying there's people living in group homes with nobody in their lives. And it's one of the things that you talked mm. to me about, Lisa, was the idea of you know, the, the wider community and also yeah. through this scheme discovering the diversity of disability yeah. and then learning how to respond to it and mm -hmm. to see, it, uh, see the challenges inherent in that but also the wonderful opportunities mm. that it presents. Yeah, everyone. from the world of physical disability, the breadth of assistance assistive technology that's available is, is enormous and fantastic. Um, people can now get support with recreation, with you know, work, all those things that um, you had to self-fund previously. Um, but what that means is that there's a whole bunch of people, myself included, that will be applying for a beach wheelchair. A wheelchair specifically, or oh, wheelchair adaption, so wheels and a special front wheel that you can get to the beach. That's the top tier. 
What could potentially happen in the bottom tier or the middle tier is that money spent to roll out beach mats, to make beaches accessible for the wider community. But the focus has been so much on the individual service that I'm going to have a beach wheelchair, but if somebody else comes to the beach in a wheelchair, bad luck, you can't get to it. So are you also saying that if, if, we, if the mindset was different, there'd be some, some easy wins in that regard? I reckon, yeah. If well, we there concentrate... already are, actually. People are buying, councils are buying there, some of these beach wheel wheelchairs. Some councils, um, yeah, not yeah. the one I live at. No, <laughs> no, no, some councils. But, you know, and shame, that's please. an example of capacity building, isn't it, yeah, to make yeah. it more accessible for That's a, right, a and simple people. things like public transport, not mm. accessible, so there's a travel allowance. Why, why don't we roll that money into making public transport accessible for as many people? There will always be people that need extra support, but we can make it as broad as possible for everybody else. Are there yeah. some communities that are doing it better than others? Um, in, yeah, in building that capacity in that middle tier for people? Uh, in, well, in terms of the physical capacity, um, I'm not entirely sure, to be quite honest. I mean, there's yeah. been no focus on it. Um, mm. The National Disability Strategy, which is of which the NDIS is one part, yeah. has been kind of left by the wayside. Mm. Um, and, you know, in Sydney, um, there are still about 100 train stations that don't mm. have wheelchair access. Yeah. Um, that's pretty basic stuff. In 2018, I would have thought. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, you know, there are people, some groups of people who are doing it worse than others. Um, and, and some who are doing better. I, I mean, I talk to disability activists as like, because I, I don't have a disability, I just wanted to find out what, you know, what is actually happening. And, you know, and they raise the point that the NDIS risks being, um, and it sounds coarse and it's not my words, but risks being a middle class scheme um, for white people yep. um, who can advocate, who have power to do, to, to um, argue for what they need. I spent a week in Cairns um, with some researchers in an, um, uh, at a homeless shelter run by Anglicare, which is essentially just um, Indigenous people fill it up. There's almost no white people there whatsoever. And they were looking at the rate of, you know, these people have criminal convictions, they're homeless. Some of them have never been involved with a service, a state government service in terms of disability support in their life. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, the vast majority of them have an acquired brain injury of some description. Mm -hmm. um, and how does that get captured? Mm. There are some there are some really good non government organisations that are have begun to build community capacity that are building the use of, of volunteers. They're recruiting Inclusion Melbourne, for example, which recruits and trains volunteers and then supports those volunteers to to work with people with intellectual disabilities and to try and support them to be part of the community. But that's a, that's increasingly a really difficult model. So they've been developing that community capacity um, with block funded services and those sorts of, of sort of indirect community development services are really under threat. I mean the other service is Jane's service mm. which has for 20 years been building the capacity uh, within the medical system, training students, uh, doctors to understand the needs of people with intellectual disability. That's about building capacity of the mainstream and maybe you can talk more about your service and how that's funded and whether it will survive. Well, our, our service has been funded uh, historically through disability services um, and so it would require... And, and our funding will run out at the end of June next year, as it's now stated. Um, so, you know, then it becomes, is, is this a priority for our health service that's under so many different stresses and strains? Um, and it very much, I think, comes into that tier two or that in information linkages and capacity building part of what the NDIS needs to be doing to try and, and support mainstream services, in this case health, to provide high quality, timely care to people with a range of disability, whether physical, social, sensory or cognitive. And um, our centre has tried very hard to do that over the years, but, you know, the, it's, it's one model, but it's the only model that is um, doing that work in Victoria. Yes, and that and our service is, um, is, is one of those that, that may be a casualty of this transition from state to federal funding as well. And is there a, a gap to make up? Sorry, Rick, yeah, right. I want to ask Lisa this as, a, as an OT. Mm -hmm. There you go, acronym up. Um, is there a gap between the number of service providers who are capable now to meet the demand and the, and the, and the shifting nature of the... You talk about the diversity of disability, the shifting yeah. nature of specific uh, demand uh, in the system to people's expectation, I've got my funding, I need this particular yeah. kind of service. Uh, the, 
there's not enough people around to actually no. deliver it. How do we make up that gap in order to, to meet that need? Well, well interestingly, um, occupational therapists who, who were providers to NDIS started their own Facebook group to disseminate information um, because there's, you're almost in, as much in the dark as participants when you're, when you're completing assessments. But um, there's a whole bunch of OTs that are actually walking away from the system. Why? Because um, the frustration, the frustration of meeting with your clients, doing an assessment, sending it in, 10 months later getting a phone call saying it's been declined. But there's a very, there's a long waiting period for assistive technology. You're often getting phone calls from the NDIS from people that don't actually understand your clinical words that you're putting down, and these are the people making decisions. So the frustrations there from clinicians as well as participants. Yeah. All right. I, I just I'm, I'm the the, the tier two business in the middle before. I mean, just as I think it helps to see that all in context. When I like when it first started that scheme, it was called tier two, and Bruce Bonnyhaddy, who was the then chairman of the NDIA, um, he kept saying, if you don't get tier two right, mm. the NDIS mm. falls over. If you don't get, like, nail that, then you are done. Um, the Productivity Commission, which is hardly known as a bastion for um, productivity, spending more money, <laughs> um, in its report into NDIS costs last year, actually said, we need to, I can't remember the exact figures, but we need to at least double or roll out the, the middle tier funding at mm. the full scheme level, which yes. is about $130 million, I think, every year. At the moment, it's about 30, I, I, don't quote me on that. But the Productivity Commission says you need to double the money. You mm. need to put the money mm. in now. You can't wait three years, because waiting three years and mm. we've done nothing to build capacity is really dangerous. Mm. I, I want to go back, yeah, talking about the capacity issue. Um, we, are, we are doubling the funding that's going into disability services, and that's just at the, the top tier. Um, there is there is such limited capacity of of workers. The bulk, there isn't a, a strong group of professionals who have been trained in disability, who have expertise about practice leadership, about program design, about management within the disability sector, because the disability sector has been so neglected over the last 20, 30 years. There, there, we don't have those strong professionals and we don't have an unlimited pool of direct support workers who are skilled uh, in, in supporting people. We have a decreasing pool. The service that I'm on the board of cannot expand because it cannot get any more workers. Mm -hmm. It's increased its workforce by 7% over the last six months and it's increased its hours of delivery by 12 percent and it said we can't we can't offer services anymore if, because we can't find people I don't, I don't want to interrupt but even the ndis agency can't mm. get work no that's right <laughs> and, that's, and the turnover <laughs> it's not ideal. so so we haven't built the workforce capacity and we're mm. going to get to the stage where and i think it's clear in sort of the skills of the planners that are there at the moment we haven't got people that are skilled to do those jobs yeah. and we need an urgent sort of sense of how are we going to educate and train the workers that we're going to need to run this system if it keeps going out at the speed that it's going. Yeah, Jane, you remain optimistic about it. We've talked about all the problems, but you remain optimistic about the potential for the NDIS to actually profoundly change people's lives. Tell us why from personal experience. I think we all do, actually. Everybody yeah. said it in their own way. Because <laughs> I just feel like we've been beaten up on the <laughs> yeah. NDIS a bit and I want to give it a bit of love. So tell us why, why you feel... Because the previous system was so mm. fragmented, so underfunded, so inequitable, so crisis-driven, so going from one year to another. Um, this scheme is built on a foundation of rights and equity and autonomy and participation and contribution. Uh, this scheme is built on insurance principles of let's build people's capacity now so that they can um, be more independent, more autonomous and contribute more in the future. Um, my son doesn't speak, he uses a, an iPad with a particular communication program on it to communicate. Let's make sure that people like, like, he ha like him has the assistive technology mm. to be independent in communication or, or uh, as much as he can, to be able to express himself and to be independent and, and to be more autonomous in his life. 
It's built on the right principles. Mm. It's going in the right direction. Um, it is responsive to change. There are a huge number of problems um, and consumer satisfaction has fallen considerably and that's reflected in that as every Facebook page that you get on <laughs> also reflects. Um, but but we got to keep our eye on the goal of where we're going because as as Bruce Bonner Haiti used to say there was there's no plan B. No. I mean we <laughs> we haven't no. got a plan B. There is we've got to make this work. And it really makes you feel alive. I yeah. find, if you don't have a plan yeah. B. But it, it, it's hard to ask people who deserve to have their needs looked after to remain patient, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wait, I've got clients waiting ten months for a commode. Like, we're not talking fancy, fancy equipment. We're talking stuff that you need every single day, several times a day. So, yeah, it's a, it's a long patient process. Christine? But we used to have hundreds of people on waiting lists, yes. waiting for yes. supported accommodation mm. in Victoria, waiting for day programs. Mm. So, so we've got to those where people we came from, will get a service, yeah. may not be the best service, um, and you know, but they will get a service in the long run that mm. they didn't get before and the important thing is they have a right to that service. Mm. If yep. they don't get it and if they've got good support to go through the Come appeal process, <laughs> you know, they can appeal at law. They can go to the AAT, they can go to the federal court and get what the legislation says they're entitled to. That's mm. fundamentally important for this scheme. We've never had the right to a service before. We're going and, to go to questions in a moment. But can I just say one thing about ageing carers because this is something Chris and I have, have both worked in with... Um, parents who are ageing, who are caring for older people with disabilities, parents in their, in their 70s, their 80s, their 90s, who have a um, 50, 60, 70 year old son or daughter with a disability who's looked after, who they've looked after all their lives and all their lives they've been frightened about what would happen when they die. Hmm. And they now have hope that the system provides that will provide for their son and they are able, son or daughter, and they are able to work towards a future for their son or daughter that, that they can actually see a future where they could see no future before. Before we go to the floor for questions, one final question. The, uh, one of the key components mm. uh, for the NDIS to flourish would be the political will for it to do so, a bipartisan approach to policy that allows it to to survive a change in government and a change in the political winds. Rick, you watch very closely yes. from Canberra. Uh, what's your sense about the permanence of the NDIS as a bipartisan It's buy there forever. It's there forever. Um, Scott Morrison is deeply on board with it. Um, and in my experience in politics and in departments, getting Treasury on board with any spending scheme is almost impossible. <laughs> um, so, and you know, for the time being, Scott Morrison is there. Labor will probably win the next election. Um, and they will have to deal with some of the problems um, that are, were there in the agreements that they struck, but they've supported You know, this is actually one of the rare things. I've, I've actually never seen something have bipartisan, apart from maybe national security, um, bipartisanship immunity from attack. Yeah. Mm. Um, because early on when I was writing stories, um, you couldn't, apart from people who were using the NDIS, you couldn't find anyone to criticise it. Labor wouldn't because it was their baby, and the coalition wouldn't because half of them were scared they'd be kicked out of government immediately, and the other half actually liked it. Um, and it's, yeah, so I think it's there forever. And just on that looking big picture for not just Australians living with disability, have we set a model that other countries are now looking at as a potential for their own futures? What do we know about that? I think if we get tier two right, we're setting a, a nice precedent. Yeah, I think we've, we've, we've copied other countries in terms of the individualised funding, but our design and the Tier 2 and the building community capacity is something that the other countries, you know, the Scandinavian countries, haven't done, for instance. They've relied on individualised support and haven't attended to social change. So I think there's enormous potential. Yes. It's yep. the first time in a long time the Scandinavians have been behind on social change. So <laughs> it's good to be ahead of them. It's our own Olympics. It's great. <laughs> They're the NDIS hipsters. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're trying to build some tier two capacity by having this conversation tonight, and that means that you have to be involved as well. Before we uh, uh, t take some call, oh, some calls, it's not on the radio anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, call you on the air. Now, um, before we take your questions, a uh, few house rules, as I said. Questions, please, no statements. They can be had uh, when we have tea and coffee after uh, the event here tonight. Please try and keep your question as tight as possible so I can move through as many of them as possible. I think we've got some microphones phones left and right so please put your hand in the air 
Uh, and uh, and we'll get to you. I think we've got a question up the front here um, from the newly minted doctor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. PhD Dr. handed in today. <laughs> <laughs> Give him a round of applause. I'm not a doctor yet. <laughs> you will be. <laughs> That's embarrassing. <laughs> so I represent children with disability um, and the early childhood intervention sector. And so my question is what about... Um, that group under the NDI's individualized packages, because what we worked for in the last 20 years um, is family-centered practices, working with families, supporting families, and what we see on the NDI's dash dashboard is none of the uptake of supports and packages by families, so they're very happy with the individualized packages because they can get therapy for their children, but what's happening to them, they're not really accessing support, and we're really worried about that. So I wonder, no one talked about children, so. Mm. <laughs> you must go take that one on. I confess I don't know anything <laughs> about children. I can, I can <laughs> answer part of that. Yeah. Um, the, the NDIS um, was um, overwhelmed, I think it's fair to say, early on. They didn't realise the numbers of children who would be coming. Um, who would be eligible. So they designed this fancy thing called the Early Childhood Early Intervention Gateway. I still don't fully understand what the gateway is, and I've been writing about it for years. Um, but the NDIA have a benchmark, and I, they were told to take this out by the Productivity Commission, but they have a benchmark with their providers who do early intervention, saying no more than 50% of kids who come to you can make it into the NDIS, which is flat out well against everything the NDIS was designed to do. Um, so I think there are some real problems in that space. Um, I, on a, it's a real opaque black box as far as I'm concerned. Um, they, every time you ask questions about it, they're like, well, we've got the gateway. Mm -hmm. The gateway has fixed it. You know, Brisbane got the gateway and it's still got a traffic problem. Like, they haven't actually gone into detail about what they're doing. And I, you know, it's, it's a mystery to me as well. And there's a lot of factors contributing here, aren't there? But um the, uh, it, it, certainly there have been many more children than I thought coming onto the scheme and very many fewer children exiting the scheme and families don't really have a sense of um, moving through that early intervention space and then to mainstream services and then we come back to tier two because the mainstream services they feel won't be safe for their children, won't be nurturing, won't be the kind of space that allows their child to develop and grow so that they are horrified by the thought of being um, ejected from the scheme uh, rather than seeing it as a graduation. <laughs> they see it as a rejection and so that's been a cultural problem. Is that a shift in mindset from wanting to have integrated, say, education spaces and whatnot? Where, where previously that was the goal, to, to try to have those services and support within mainstream schooling, for instance. And, and, yeah, and, and there's, there's a lot of tension between who provides what within yeah. the schools and how much is a, an education responsibility and how much the child brings with their individual funding to the school. Yeah. Um, there's all sorts of problems in, in that space. So it's, uh, you're quite right, it's, you know, we've been working in a family-centred practice for 30 years and it still hasn't happened. We're still looking at the child and trying to mm. target the child with various interventions. Yeah. Perhaps we don't say we're trying to fix the child anymore, but we're still working on the child, whereas that's not the issue. The issue is the family and the issue is the system in which that family uh, it belongs. I think there's a question from uh, someone in the middle, then we'll come down the front here. So stand up and uh, make yourself known and, and please introduce yourself and ask away. Thank you. Um, I'm Lindsay and I'm a parent. I'm interested in uh, the quality and safeguarding techniques that have been put in place and could I just have your thoughts on whether you think those techniques are going to be adequate for people with cognitive or intellectual disabilities to protect us from practices of sharp providers? Um, I, I think we should be deeply worried about the safeguards that haven't quite been put in place yet. Um, there's a Quality and Safeguards Commission that has just been established, but it's not actually operating at the moment. July. July. Yeah. July. Um, and so at the moment we're, we're using the state-based safeguards that we had, things like community visitors, OPA, the Disability Service Commission and the disability standards. So it's a bit of a, of a sort of unknown how that's going to work. But in Victoria, I reckon we have the best safeguarding system of all of the states and there's concern that that's under threat. 
For example, we have community visitors who are volunteers, who are really well trained, who go and inquire into the quality of every single group home in the state. And, and do a report and then the report gets the reports get consolidated together and they get presented to Parliament. That's a very strong safeguarding system that we have and, and we're not sure what's going to happen um, when, when the new system takes over. At the moment it seems to be a very cursory, you have to register as a provider but there's no control about, you don't have to evidence that you're providing high quality <laughs> services. For example, we have, we've been doing a longitudinal study about uh, the quality of supported accommodation and we know that if staff use a practice called active support, then you will get good quality outcomes. That's an evidence-based practice. We can measure it and we should be saying we won't fund any services unless they can demonstrate they meet that standard. But at the moment, we're not seeing that type of regulation we're seeing a very hands-off type of approach. That's a really good example of one way in which the legislation is poorly written because I know early on the NDIA were really worried that they were giving out services to people um, for... Well, people were hiring chiropractors but couldn't necessarily provide any evidence that they were chiropractors who were doing the right thing. Um, and there's no power for the CEO of the agency to require a particular type of evidence, i.e. one that might be peer-reviewed and and research properly, um, and that's just another a gap in the market. But again, with the safeguards, um, I don't think they actually know properly what they're actually going to do yet either. No, We've got till July. We've got six months, <laughs> or three months. It's a race. <laughs> Fortunately, in Victoria, we have a very strong safeguarding system, as Chris said, and our Disability Services Commissioner is working very strongly with the Federal Safeguard Commission yeah. um, to ensure that the federal system um, is is well, hopefully as good or almost as good as the Victorian one um, so that we do cover those things. But I agree, Lindsay, it's a, it's a worry and we need to keep watching that space. And I have two questions down the front here. So it's the uh, gentleman in row number two. There's been somebody there, Dave. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, look, I'll try and... Uh, I won't make any, any statements. I'll try and keep off my soapbox. It's a little bit difficult. But I, I've also got a, a wide experience in disability, and I'm actually like Jane. I also have a son who has a very severe disability. And I'm probably one of the few ageing parents who actually has his son now fully supported by the NDIS. And uh, 12 Can months you ago... Use the microphone? Oh, sorry. Yeah. And uh, uh, 12 months ago, he went on to the NDIS, transitioned early, and he's now being fully supported. So we started the process of becoming to see his mum and dad. Now, not, not, a, not a straightforward process. We're still working on it. But I'm also working with a number of other people, uh, and some have got good outcomes, some have got some terrible outcomes, and some are in the middle. So I've actually got three questions, if that's okay. I'll sort of try and pull them together, just to give you a, a feel for where I'm coming from. Just quickly, because we've got other people yep. who need to... Sure. I'm working with one family who has been destroyed totally due to the NDIS lack of process and not following legislation. Is the panel aware if the NDIS is responding to the negative outcomes of their uh, decision-making? Let's go with that. So if, if someone has an adverse... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if they feel they've had an adverse assessment mm -hmm. and, and have their, maybe their funding is is not what they expected or it's completely changed their domestic situation as a consequence, yeah. how quickly does it, do we get a response, do you think? Well, I guess uh, you're able to appeal and review your, uh, your plan, which is, is quite a long, lengthy process. However, we've got to consider that maybe the NDIS are listening because they're changing the pathway, they're trialling a new pathway system so that hopefully people give feet, well, people are meant to be um, provided with the draft of their plan before it, it actions. So in many ways, I think the NDIS are listening that the process is not completely right. So it's in, it's in process. One more question then, I think we, it's only fair that we move it on. I'll throw the last question in which sort of encompasses the other one that I was thinking about. Uh, would Trobe University consider creating a working party to investigate and work in partnership, I love that word, in partnership with the NDIA to enable the system to work better for its participants? Uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, University. the answer is yes. <laughs> I can speak on behalf of the research centre that, that I, I direct in that we are doing a lot of research that's funded uh, competitively through the ARC and through the industry partners that we work with, which is trying uh, to look at how effective service systems are, how effective mainstream service systems are. We would we would love to work with the NDIA. Um, one of the issues that we hadn't had a chance to raise is that 
there has been almost no investment in research. There's been lots of sh enormous amount of consultancy, ah, yeah. um, short-term projects. You know, when the TAC spends millions of dollars on research, and that's a very small insurance scheme compared to the NDIA. There was a promise at the beginning that there would be, I mean, it was in the Productivity Commission, there would be a significant investment in research, and they just haven't had the capacity, the time, to focus on that. So I think the research, their support for research, their partnerships with academia, hopefully will begin to develop over time. We're certainly, and I know the, some of the other universities are, that's one of the benefits. There are now many, many more researchers interested in disability than there's ever been before. So that's part of that People are coming into yeah. this space. That's a part of that capacity building in, yeah. in that central tier that we're talking about, is it not? Very yeah. much, yeah. Yeah. Now, we've got a question down the front here. From you, sir. Uh, Tony Trigal, parent. Uh, how much legality do you see in the NDIS service agreement, uh, considering it does not appear in the NDIS Act? Thank you. So we, we might need a little bit more expert. The service agreement, or do you, do you mean the service agreement that participants have with their providers? Yeah. yeah. Every participant has yeah. A service yeah. It's got no yeah. legality at all. So it's almost like a contract, isn't it? That the service provider says, I'm going to provide this amount of service, and the participant agrees. So, so are, you, are you worried about when the service provider does something wrong, or someone breaches that contract? Yeah. What happens in that yeah. case? Yeah. yeah. It's, the first time they, it's the first time they've actually had something that says, hey, this is what you're supposed to get. Yeah. Mm. So a measurable outcome, that if you're unhappy yeah. with, you, with mm. your outcome, what's your address? That's actually a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the contract is between uh, you uh, as the consumer yeah. and the yeah. service that you're yeah. purchasing. And I know services have been looking at the legalities of those things and drawing them up so that you have to give um, you know, a certain amount of notice if you want to change providers but that is the essence of the scheme that if you're not happy with the provider that you've contracted to do your your support you can take it you can take your money and go somewhere else yeah. you which you've never been able to do before Absolutely. so that's yeah. the benefits of the market whether there is somewhere else to go mm -hmm. is yeah. another question but, but so I think, I think you're right to worry about what you know what happens if you need redress because the NDIA isn't no. Control doesn't, doesn't work very well for people with high support needs yeah. as they don't move easily. Yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. And some service providers are not very good, but there's also some areas where there aren't many service providers. Yeah. Um, and also, in terms of goods and services, I mean, the NDIA is not a consumer, it's not the ACCC or yeah. it's not consumer law. And so you've got this whole defrayed field now of the NDIA might have problems if that funding's been used um, in the wrong way. But if you've got a dud service, well, then that's on you now under this mm. new scheme. It's like you or your advocate um, to find someone else. And if you don't, there is no fallback option. You need um, like ACCC or Consumer Affairs yeah. to hold them to account. I agree. In the, in the yep. mm. We hear you, sir, and it's a very good point that you've made. So we might take a question from, from here, down the front here as well. Uh, my name is Tara. I am taking it back to psychosocial disability because I'm managing a mental health service that's being defunded in Victoria with NDIS. Mm. So we're basically supporting all our clients to move from recovery framework into permanent disability. And I have some concerns around taking away the therapeutic support for people to become independent and putting them into a system where they're getting services instead that can provide more care needs. And I'm just wondering what the experience has been in other regions where this has happened earlier and what you've seen in terms of the therapeutic outcomes. I haven't seen any specific outcomes in my reporting, but I mean, I, I told that example about the Queensland government um, axing one of its services. Um, what happens when people get into the NDIS is one of, again, it's a black spot for me. I haven't spoken to any people with psychosocial disability who've made it into the NDIS and who are um, happy and talking about what, how that's changed their life. But I know that that whole issue around uh, the recovery model versus mm. the fact that the NDIA legislation or the NDIS legislation requires you to ex demonstrate that your mental illness is permanent yeah. and that you won't recover from it rather than episodic and occasionally extremely debilitating, um, that's a huge problem. Um, and I don't think they've, I mean, I think the Productivity Commission 
um, recommended that that not be changed. And so I think that's just going to be one thing that just carries on now. And in the trial sites, I spoke to some people with psychosocial disability and the difficulty they're facing with the fluctuating and um, changeable nature of their disability, um, no, you get your set number of hours a week and that's what you get. And this is part of what we're talking about with um, the NDIA are probably not that good at pivoting probably pivot like an ocean liner. <laughs> so eventually you might get what you need, but by then that need might have passed. So yes, that is quite an unfortunate um, outcome, I think. And for people with a mental illness, they're, they're, the fluctuation means they're moving between the disability sector and the health yep. sector, and that interface is still problematic. Mm -hmm. um, and the NDIS cannot fix the state's mental health services, which are already under enormous strain, as you know, and inadequate for many people anyway. So it's, it's a real, um, it's, it's a very nasty gap there around can I, the NDIS. Can I just flip it? Can I ask you whether you think mental, psychosocial disability is a good fit for the NDIS? For some people it very well might be. The, we have some huge concerns around um, simply within the NDIS, the costings means that we can't have... I have an excellent team of highly skilled staff, none of which I could pay mm. within NDIS. So where, where, do you, where do you propose or where are you looking to, uh, to fill that shortfall in funding? What are your options? Well, I think we could continue some of the mental health community support services and the FAMS programs that have been running. I'm not saying those services are perfect, but I think taking out huge mm. service systems and just stripping that away because 10% of the people who are receiving those services can now get them elsewhere, still leaves 90% with a huge gap. Yeah, right. And we've seen nearly a 20% increase in ED presentations for people with mental illness. Yeah. Which is what and you this mean. is going to cost us a lot yeah. more than the current systems are costing. Absolutely. I think it's really interesting. Maybe mm -hmm. the, the, as you say, the NDIS is here to stay, but maybe the inclusion of people with mental illness problems may not be always included. It was a late inclusion in the Productivity Commission. They weren't in the original design, and, and the, there was substantial lobbying to bring them in. And, and I think it is a, it's the most problematic And it was sort of only area. meant to be those people who had the severe permanent cognitive impairment that comes from a chronic psychosis over time. You know, it was meant to be for a very small proportion. It was never envisaged that it would replace the state mental but health services. The, the way they came up with their modelling, because it was so last minute, they just looked at the number of presentations to, I think it was acute psychiatric mm. facilities in one year, which happened to be 57,000, boom, there it is, it's 57,000 in the NDIS. Beyond that, they don't actually know yeah, <laughs> um, who's out there. I, I, in a perfect world, I think you would have it in the NDIS, but you would have all of those existing programs continue, mm. um, because if you don't fit into one, then you, uh, you can still get the other. Mm. Do we have any more questions from the floor before we finish up and uh, we have the opportunity to continue the conversation over tea and coffee? We've got one here and then one over and a few more, but we'll come to uh, the, uh, the, uh, there's a woman just so, in our middle row here <laughs> who'd like to ask a question. And then we'll come to you over here. Hi, Sue Jackson. I'm doing a PhD with Chris, actually, on the making of the NDIS. Um, my question is about the concern that the panel have raised and also come up here and also which the Productivity Commission raised in the costs inquiry uh, or review um, about getting an adequate number of adequately skilled and trained staff in the system to make it work. Partic and I guess this is in the context of how do we fix, to, fix this, given that it is low, low paid marginal work in many instances um, it's likely to become more precarious under NDIS and given that despite the emphasis on market, the NDIS in this regard is not really a market. Somebody said it's a monopsony. monopsony. There's only one buyer who sets prices that then have an impact on how much people can be paid. How are we ever going to address the workforce issue? It's um, that's a, so you would know that the Productivity Commission, I'm not saying I agree with this, but they, you know, it is such a dire problem that they're like, oh, perhaps the federal government should consider changing the Immigration Act. Um, they're just like, just bring in more people because we don't have a market here. We don't have the workers. I think the workforce has to triple, um, double or triple. Um, and, you know, 
pay, paying workers properly, is probably a part of that mm. um, because it does pay low. It's extremely rewarding work, um, but I think you've got to look at the conditions. I'm not saying you need to have some overarching um, enterprise bargaining agreement like you did in childcare or something like that, but as it is, um, essentially this is an extremely libertarian project. Um, I think even the IPA said some nice words about it in the beginning. Um, and you're, you are throwing people to the market, and some people are perfectly well equipped to deal with that, some people aren't, um, but that's going to have a huge effect on driving down. I mean, we've got, you know, industrial decisions now with the... You've got two people at odds, essentially, so you've got workers who might only get funded to do one-hour visits, um, and you've got the person with a disability who only gets funded for one hour, and they're like, well, I don't need you for the minimum two-hour shift. Um, but that's against the current award, as I understand it, the Social Services Award. So you've got this whole new world opening up. And, I, and part of the problem, just quickly, was that market stewardship was meant to, you know, the government was meant to be overseeing all of this. And the Department of Social Services and the NDIA couldn't decide between them who was actually looking after what. Um, and I think they've only just now decided um, with the, the umpire of the Productivity Commission to divvy up the work on that one. And it's five years into the NDIS. Mm -hmm. I have a question over here. Do you think a contributing cause of the problems with the NDIS might lie in its um, conceptual framework? So, for example, um, an insurance model which has a reliance on um, long-term um, benefit and a reliance on um, economic product Activity, which leaves out a lot of vulnerable people, um, and uh, an over-reliance on market forces to um, solve the problems of um, availability of, of services and quality of, of services. Um, and I know there was a lot of things negative about the welfare system, but um, you know you're talking about um, the need for a um, provider of last resort. Are, are we going away too much away from government responsibility? Has it swung too far to the market? Uh, uh, from my point of view, at a theoretical level, we've seen we, it's the collision of neoliberalism and marketisation with the rights agenda, and they sort of came together. And what we're seeing now is the tensions and the contradictions between a rights agenda and individual control and choice and, and collective provision and neoliberal markets and individualisation. And there are always tensions there and I think that's what we're seeing playing out. So they're inherent in the design of the scheme. But, you know, the welfare state had t tensions too. So we have to deal with them as best we can. There's never an ideal welfare yeah. system. I, I, I think, um, you know, even if, you, even if you believe in small government, um, the one thing government should fund are people who need the most help. And in many cases, that's people with disabilities. Um, I don't think you should, people should shy away from the fact that um, maybe the productivity gains aren't all going to be there in the NDIS. Um, you know what? They don't have to be. As long as people are getting support to live a life um, you know, out in the community and not you know, hidden away at home or in an institution, you don't have to sell it. And I think that was part of the problem originally. It was, it was sold as some kind of magic elixir because that was the only way it could get through. And I get that. I get the political expediency of having to do that. But now we're dealing with the tail end of that, saying, well, God, we've got to get all these people into work. We've got to get all these carers into work. Um, we're not allowed to pay the carers to care for um, their child or their family member, even though that's happening in, in the, on the odd occasion. Um, but I don't think it's... The conceptual framework is so at odds with um, your core business as a government, which is protecting the most vulnerable in your community, and I don't think it should be a bad thing mm -hmm. um, it, if that's the goal. It feels a lot like that the NDIA underestimated the diversity within the disability community and expected that markets would easily pick up because we all know exactly what people with disability yeah. needs. And the literature, the flyers, all did yeah. look the same. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got time for, for a couple more questions. There's one from the side of the room, and then there's one up the front here. Thank you. Fascinating discussion. Uh, Matt Vine from Plan Management Partners. It was interesting to hear um, all the challenges, the vast number of challenges that um, the regulatory bodies, the NDIA, are facing in implementing this you know, ambitious scheme. What I'm interested in your views on is uh, the prioritisation. So 
Where do they go first? NDI have got you know, a finite amount of resources, so do the regulatory bodies. Where do you see the main challenges? Where should they go first to f kind of fix the shortcomings of the implementation of the scheme? Let's run the board here and, and ask which each of our panellists feel would be the best place to start. Jane, with you. Gee. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not quite sure. I think, w well, uh, an area, I'm not sure it should be the first one, but an area is this tier two business, to put, put more money into that because we've got to get those mainstream services better equipped to work with the diversity in our community um, because because that uh, that's the foundation of the NDIS. The NDIS is the icing on top of that cake. If you don't have the cake there, then it's not much point in having the icing, you know. Um, so I think the tier two stuff and the, uh, the quality and safety framework so that there is a way of holding services accountable and... Um, there has to be some moral hazard in service provision, doesn't there? It yeah. Doesn't there? If, if you don't do, do your job right, you need to be held to account. Yeah, abs absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Please. Lisa. Uh, along with the tier two, mm -hmm. I think upskilling the planners and the LACs because if, the, if participants with disabilities can speak to them and they understand what's going on, then the people on indi in individualised packages will be half a step ahead of what they are now. Christine? Well, I agree with them, but uh, I think there's also some easy wins in terms of, of training and qualifications of support workers and of planners and of uh, support coordinators. If we introduce mandatory qualifications, then the education system will be bound to start to deliver those. There's already the TAFE system, there's the university system, we're more than willing to do that. And I think that's a good way of managing the quality, because it's the quality mm. that is the worry as this scheme ro rolls out. Yeah, I mean, it's an extension of that, but planning, planning, planning. The, it, the NDIS is a classic case of having tried to fix a problem because they were so worried about meeting a deadline mm. that they made the problem a lot worse. Um, so they are now at a stage where they're trying to approve, I can't remember the exact figure, but it's something like 200, 500 plans a day. But then they've got plan reviews of all the plans they stuffed up in the first place, um, mounting up that are almost at a greater rate than the plans they have to get through in the, in the first instance. So um, it's a classic example of um, outcomes you have when you are in a panic and you don't strategize and they tried to meet deadlines which weren't their deadlines. I feel really bad for the people in the agency to be quite honest. Um, and yeah, you've got to, you've got, you just do the plans properly, do them right the first time, spend the time to get it right and you're not going to have to worry about the back end stuff. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. The tea and coffee has arrived so there's an opportunity for, to continue the conversation afterwards. But to oh, finish up, kind here. of answered a bit of my question. I um, provide support coordination for a medium-sized company, and we've got probably about three to four hundred people we support. Um, we've had about a hundred or so plans come through, and probably not one of them has actually come through that we have not had to request a review on. Mm. And we're being told it's going to take three months just for them to say yes or no whether they'll do a review, yeah. not actually to make a review. Mm. Um, so do you think there will become a tipping point in these all these issues we've outlined with people not plan, doing plans properly, not understanding what the actually therapeutic needs are of people, where it will get to a point where they go, OK, we need to step back and review this whole before it gets too big. <laughs> I think they're getting really close to that now. They just admitted in Senate estimates earlier this month that when I mentioned the plans that run out because they just haven't had someone get around to it, um, they've now decided, and I don't know why this wasn't a priority to begin with, but they've now decided that those plans that run out when they don't have a service, um, they're going to prioritise reviewing those ones quickly. Um, so that's movement. Um, but I think, I think that, whole, that whole system, I mean, they've got the pathway changes and whatnot coming through, but I think that really elemental level that whole system is causing them a lot of pain internally, just from a workforce point of view. Um, and the reviews take forever. Um, and I think early on it started as a kind of, um, I don't want to be too cynical even though I'm a journalist, I think it started as a bit of a delaying tactic, um, particularly when they were really contentious decisions. Because I know the NDIA, they're really worried about losing legal battles, mm. um, like the transport case, the McGarrigal case in the federal court. 
Um, so I think they would, you know, hope that people just accept their plan and then um, take it to re internal review and then, then fight it in the AAT and eventually get around to reviewing it. And once that, if they lose the AAT, then they'll do the review and that takes another four to five months. So I think that was part of the original thinking and now it's just, it's really weighing them down. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your participation tonight. Can you also thank our panel as well for their expertise and insight? Tea and coffee will be served, and our next event is on Wednesday, 18th of April uh, at 6.30pm uh, at the Sofitel in mm -hmm. Collins Street. Diet and identity, the rise of veganism, that's going to be an interesting discussion. Uh, if you want to come <laughs> along to that, you know, the Bold Thinking website, head to that. And uh, there's also a really interesting, uh, for those foreign policy wonks amongst us, uh, Australian foreign policy in a contested Indo-Pacific region with uh, the uh, Foreign Minister Julie Bishop is happening at the Grand Hyatt on uh, Wednesday the 11th of April from 7.15pm. Go to the website as well to find out more details and of course your tickets. And thank you for being here tonight and continue the conversation. <laughs>